Wasn't that song absolutely incredible? Man, I just wanted to like beat on something. All those drums, it was going crazy in this place. I loved it. I love it. I love it. I love it. How many of you know it is a blessing to be a part of Grace Church? My name is Pastor Dallas Wilson. I'm the adult ministries pastor here. And by the way, just in case you didn't know, I love you. And uh, I am proud to be a part of this family called Grace. Uh, Another thing that I'm extremely proud of is that I get to serve underneath who I believe to be some of the greatest pastors in America. Pastor Garrett and Andrea Booth, Dan and Rachel Hunter. Can I hear it for these guys? Now, I know right now while you're clapping, you're looking around going, where are they? Where are they? Well, they're not physically in the house today, but for good reason. We're very proud of them. Pastor Dan, this weekend... He walked with his master's degree, and and we're celebrating him. And Pastor Garrett, he graduated this weekend with his PhD, Dr. Garrett Booth. They're actually watching online right now. So can I go ahead and hear it? But also, I want them to feel the love in the house that we have for them right now. Yes. You know you hear us. Feel us out there in TV land, Pastor Garrett, Pastor Dan. We love you. We're proud of you. We honor you. Also, we're excited about honoring this Christmas holiday. Who's excited about Christmas Eve coming up at Grace on December 24th? Let me go ahead and tell you, we're going to do it big. You like that song? Man, don't let your neighbors, your family, and friends miss something like that on Christmas Eve. Make sure they are here with you. We have two opportunities for you, one at 2 p.m. and another one at 4 p.m. Here's the thing. We got to make sure that Houston knows, and they will know on Christmas Eve, that Christmas is not about consumerism. It's about Christ. Make sure you make plans to be here. Do not miss out on Christmas Eve here at Grace. Well, I sure have enjoyed this series called Miracles that we're in. This series has been all about celebrating Christmas and the miracle that it is. How many of you know that God sending his son to earth is a miracle? Or how about this one? Maybe you missed it. The virgin birth. That is a miracle. But in this Christmas season, I don't want you just celebrating miracles. I want you to start expecting miracles in your lives. And with that in your mind and in your heart, here's what I want to encourage you to do. Go ahead and pull out your notepad, your pen, pull out your cell phone. If you want, open up the YouVersion app. All the notes and scriptures for today are right there at your fingertips, whether you're in the house or you're watching online. I'm gonna say some stuff, but more importantly, I believe the Holy Spirit has something very important he is wanting to say to you today, and I don't want you to miss a moment of it. Two weeks ago when we kicked off this series, Pastor Ray started us off with a sermon titled The Miracle Mission. And it was about the greatest rescue mission ever pulled off, and it was God sending his son to earth. And because of what Jesus did by coming as a little tiny baby, we now have a rescue mission of our own to go and reach a hurt and lost world. And how many of you know we all have friends and relatives that need Jesus in this Christmas season? Last week, Pastor Andrea, she talked about the miracle birth, but also about how we can see miracles birthed in our lives as, well, I'm all about that one. She actually said, and I loved it, she goes, if you're looking for a miracle, you're in the right place. And let me go and tell you, because of where you're sitting And because of how you're positioning your heart today, you're telling God, here I am, show up in a real and tangible way in my life. How many of you are with me on that today? This week, we're gonna be focusing in on the miracle light. The miracle light. Now, you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that singular light 
that marked the birth of God sending his only son from heaven down to earth and a star that led the magi, that is the wise man, across the known earth to a little baby named Jesus. Now maybe you don't know what I'm talking about today, but I'll tell you what, we're gonna change all of that. I'm gonna make sure that you all know exactly what I'm talking about, but for those of you that may not know and you're feeling a little bad about yourselves, don't worry. There are other people that were a little confused this week too. In fact, I went up to a few people and I asked them this question, name a fascinating star. Now, when I asked this question, I thought I might get you know, answers like Alpha Centauri or the North Star, but what I ended up with was quite surprising. The first person I asked, name a fascinating star, they looked at me and they said, Dwayne the Rock Johnson. <laughs> and yeah, his muscles are pretty inspirational. The next person I went up to and I said, name a fascinating star. And they go, Lady Gaga, I mean, Taylor Swift. <laughs> and then the last one, I, I really just enjoyed the way she responded all together. I said, name a fascinating star. And she said, Tom Cruise. And then she went on to say, he just seems to get cuter and cuter. I just don't understand. <laughs> those may be fascinating stars to some, but those are, of course, stars to entertain. What I'm talking about today are the stars at night. What I'm talking about today are stars at night that happen to be big and bright. Now, as Texans, you already know where I'm going with this. In fact, could you help me finish this lyric real fast as we're talking about stars today? I thought it's only fitting. Okay, here we go. The stars at night are big and bright. Oh, I felt that. You know what? That is officially a Christmas song of celebration. Yes. Jesus in Texas. Yeah. But for real, though, have you ever been out in the country on a dark and clear night and you've looked up into the night sky and you've been overwhelmed by all the stars that lay before you? And in that moment, as you look up, how many of you know it's hard to focus on just one? I think it's a lot like that in this Christmas season that we find ourselves in. There are so many lights around us that it's hard to focus in on just one. But this morning, here's what I'm asking you to do. Push pause. I want you to push pause on your busy schedule I want you to push pause on all your meal planning and all the events you have to go to and the gifts you haven't gotten yet. I want you to push pause on that and I wanna focus you in on the star not created for earthly entertainment but with divine purpose in mind and for a plan that connected the birth of Christ. We find it talked about in Matthew chapter two starting in verse one brings up the Christmas star, or what I like to call today the original Christmas ornament. Let's go ahead and start in verse one. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? Now, they didn't know anything about this. They said, we saw a star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. And all Jerusalem with him. When he called together, when he had called together all the people's chiefs and priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judea, are by no means least among, lost my place, here we go. You know what, I'm gonna look right here because I lost it. Least among the rulers of Judea. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people, Israel. Then Herod, called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. Because remember, he's scared, he's nervous. 
He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. He's trying to trick them. After they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the Christ child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary. And they bowed down and they worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. In the midst of these verses, we see a star. You see, the Magi and the wise men, they actually commented about it right there back in verse two to King Herod. And in verse seven, we see King Herod asking the Magi about when the star actually first appeared. He was trying to figure this thing out. And then we read about in verse nine how the star rested over the place where the Christ child could be found. Now, what about this star? the original Christmas ornament. What exactly was it? Well, the Bible is, to a large degree, silent on the specifics of the star as to what it was. Now, we could speculate a little bit. I mean, some have suggested that it was actually just Jupiter. Or others have had the idea that maybe it had been a conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn And it had somehow formed the symbol of the fish that would be the early symbol of Christianity for the persecuted church. Wouldn't that have been cool? I like that idea. Or maybe some say it was just a meteor or maybe even a comet. None of these considerations can be certifiable as fact. We really just don't know for certain. What we do know, though, is that the star speaks of God's glory. What we do know is that the star speaks of God's glory. The star in the sky, like I said earlier, was the original Christmas ornament, and it speaks of God's glory. Now, this morning, if I was to ask you, what is your favorite type of ornament? I feel like I would get all sorts of answers across this entire place, but I I thought I would just go ahead and give you an example of a few that I know somebody out there found some way to love a whole lot. Okay, for many of you, if I ask you what your favorite ornament was, it wouldn't be about its beauty, it would be about who made it for you, okay? Maybe a grandkid, a kid, or a niece, or a nephew. Maybe it looks something like that right there. Ooh. You know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder or maybe just the love that we have for the person that gave it to us, okay? I mean, how many of you know that there's a grandparent out there somewhere that's proud of this disgusting, melting snowman? Or or maybe uh, there are some people out there, this is for my vegan and vegetarian friends, they've got a big meal coming up. Uh, you know, and, and so they grab this and decorate their tree with it. Not, not so appetizing for me. I, I think I'd be more like, I need a turkey leg or like a big ham. You know, I'll hang that on my tree. Uh, or, or do we got any beach bums out there? They're all about the warm Christmas breeze. Okay. Well, how many of you would be curious what I might look like as a merman? Okay, you can hang this on the tree this year. Oh, yeah, there we go. Mmm. Mmm. I look good. Or maybe some of you want to go so old school with your Christmas decorations, you're going back even before Jesus came to earth as a little tiny baby. How about this one? You got a dinosaur and a tutu celebrating a birthday party. Oh, yeah. All creation celebrates Jesus this Christmas. You know, I find that when it comes to Christmas ornaments, that people usually like the ones most that shine and reflect light. Those that light up a room and that light up a tree. Ornaments that shine bright in the light are usually quite popular. And the original Christmas ornament, that is the Christmas star, well, guess what? It shone quite bright with God's light and with God's glory. And all throughout the Bible, we find light associated with God's glory. You don't believe me? Well, let's take a look. In Exodus chapter 13, 
we find that God led the way for his people to come out of Egypt and make their way to a new place. Here it is. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Let me go and tell you, when you're letting God lead the way, it doesn't matter the circumstance. You can make it through. Goes on, gives us another illustration of light in Exodus chapter 24, 15 through 17, when we see Moses and he's on Mount Sinai and we saw the glory of the Lord like a radiant light all around him. When Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai for six days. The cloud covered the mountain and on the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud to the Israelites the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. And when Moses all of a sudden felt and he spent all this time in the presence of God, it was more than just what people saw on the mountain. It started actually having an effect on him. And it said that when he came out of the presence of God, that there was actually an afterglow. He was like a night light. He was walking around and his face was like... How many of you know that could be a little freaky? Well, we find that it freaked them out a little bit too. Exodus chapter 24, verse 30, it says, when Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant and they were afraid to come near him. Let me go and tell you something real fast. This morning, I'm not saying to shine in such a way that you freak people out, but I am saying that when we've spent time with Jesus, we're all going to stand out. But we don't just see it in the Old Testament, we see it in the New Testament also, when the light showed up in the announcement to the shepherds about Jesus come to earth. We find it right here in Luke chapter two, verse nine. An angel of the Lord appeared to them. How cool is that? And the glory of the Lord shone around them. There's no mistaking the glory of the Lord in this, but also there's no mistaking that light is associated directly with Jesus. Right in Revelation chapter 22, Jesus actually calls himself a star. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. God, his glory and light are consistent throughout scripture and very much present in the original Christmas ornament, that is the Christmas star. I got something I want you to allow just to sink into your psyche this morning. We shine when Christ shines in us. It's not about how bright you can be, it's about how bright you allow God to be through you, what kind of ornament are you? What kind of ornament are you? Now, I recently actually heard a story about a family who was all about decorating for Christmas. How many of you got a family like that? They were especially all about decorating the tree. And every year, they would love pulling out the ornaments as a family, and they would reach in the box, and they would grab this, and they would grab that, and they would put it here, they would put it there. But there was one ornament in particular that was by far the favorite of the family. It was the tree topper. It was the star. It was an ornament that you could put at the top, and when you put it up there, it actually lit up for everyone to see in the room. It was always the highlight. Well, one year when they pulled the ornaments out and the father took the star and he placed it on top of the tree to their great disappointment, the light didn't come. It didn't work anymore. Well, with a lot of sorrow and sadness and whining and frustration and irritation, the father reached up on the tree and he took down the ornament lacking light and he put it back in the box, stuffed it away somewhere out of sight. Well, one year and then two years and then three years and four years went by. And the ornament that used to be the highlight of the tree 
became merely a memory. It no longer was there to celebrate the coming of Christ. It was no longer a part of their Christmas celebration. Well, the next year came and the father pulled out the ornaments and somehow he came across the box of reject ornaments and decided to give it another look. He reached inside seeing the star and did what dads do. He messed with it until it started working again. Well, the family was really happy as he took the, light, took, the, took the ornament now with light inside of it and put it back up on the tree in celebration of a season and the coming Savior. Church, may I suggest to you that the ornament in the story is a testimony of too many Christians' lives. Once shining so bright, we've allowed the light of Christmas and the light of Jesus in our, light, in our lives to go out. And needing once again to be filled with the power and absorb the glory of the Lord so that our light can shine bright once more. Can I ask you a personal question this morning? Is your life like the original Christmas ornament? Are you allowing God's glory to shine through you? Do you have an afterglow from being in the presence of God? Can people see you coming because of Jesus inside of you? How bright are you? Are you getting your shine on? I'll tell you what, church, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I'm not going to hide it when I go to work. No, I'm going to let it shine. I'm not going to hide it when I go to school. No, I'm going to let it shine. I'm not going to hide it when I go home. Because guess what, guys? Our spouse and our children need to see our light brighter than anyone else in our lives. I'm going to let it shine. And when I'm with my family and friends this Christmas, and it's so easy to get sucked into distracting old arguments and disagreements, no, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. We're not going to let Satan blow it out. We're going to let it shine. Because church, in this Christmas season, you're probably the only Christmas star anyone's going to see. And this Christmas, you're either leading towards or away from Jesus. We shine when Christ shines in us. We're called to reflect his glory. But there's more. It's not just about allowing the star to speak of God's glory in our life. The star also speaks of God's guidance. Number two, the star speaks of God's guidance. Are you allowing God to guide you? Can I ask you a serious question this morning? What is guiding your life? Is it your career? Is it greed? Is it ego? Is it pride? Is it lust? Is it entertainment? Are you focusing on the wrong stars this Christmas? Where your heart is, scripture says, so your treasure will be also. Or how about if I put it like this? Where your head is, is where you're headed. Where are you putting your mind at? Where's your time, your talent, your energy going towards? What you focus on all day determines where you're going in life. Where your head is, is where you're headed. And in our busy world, particularly at Christmas, 
there are a lot of bright lights. There's a lot of things vying for your attention. These stars are demanding that we follow them, and it's easy to become so distracted, caught up in all the celebrations and the tinsel and the presents and the food and the Hallmark movies, Lindsay. Please don't make me watch another one. In the Christmas sales and even in the New Year sales, they seem to go on and on pushing Jesus or trying to push Jesus out of the picture. I think in our society that many people recognize Jesus. I mean, you walk into most places and you're going to see a nativity. And most people in America, at least, are aware overall that Christianity and Christmas are somehow connected. But just because they're aware of the idea of Jesus doesn't mean that they recognize what that means in their lives. They see the star, but they don't pause to really consider what he has to do with them. They don't respond with their feet and hearts like the wise men, like the magi. Now, we don't know much about the magi, but the scripture we read earlier says that they came from the east. What we don't know, however, but we can certainly speculate on, is that they gave up something when they started their journey. I mean, after all, these were very successful, intelligent, educated men. In a time where that really made you stand out, because not everybody had an education or place like that in society. These men were known to work directly for royalty and the extremely wealthy, which means they had very successful careers. And as a result, they probably, probably, they had, they had big fortunes too. And I'm assuming attached to all of that, that they probably had an extensive family that was dependent on them. And again, with all of this on the line, how many of you know it was all attached to what we would call their reputation? How silly do you think the Magi might have looked when they went before their king saying, uh, sir, we saw this thing in the sky and we think we're supposed to follow it. According to what we're studying, there's actually a king greater than you, and we've got to follow it, not knowing where it's going to go, what it's going to take us to, but we know we have to go. How many of you know they put it all on the line? It wasn't like they put an address into Waze or Google and said, oh, this is going to take us two years. And there's like a comfortable car that they're going to get in with air conditioning. Maybe it was a Tesla, and it just drives for them, and then, you know, they wake up from a nap and get out of the car and go in, Jesus, we're here. There was a journey. They didn't know how long it was gonna take. They didn't know how dangerous it was gonna be. They just knew they had to go. The Magi followed the star. They had a single focus, and that, sting, that single focus led them mile after mile. That focus allowed them to put things in the correct priority and remove from their schedules those things that were un important, leaving them even undone. They put it all on the line, and they took that step of faith and were rewarded by meeting Jesus. We also don't know exactly what the journey will be like that Jesus will lead us on. In fact, some of you this morning may be feeling like God's calling you to take a step that makes you feel a little uneasy, makes you uncomfortable. Maybe you're looking at it going, well, I'm not sure about being obedient to that because how is it going to affect my career? Or is it going to interrupt my comfort? Well, how long is it gonna take? How much is it gonna cost me? We may not know all the details, but what we do know is that he's in the details and he's for us. God has a destination in mind for you. A destination where one day you will see Jesus Christ face to face. Isn't that beautiful? 
And at that moment, all the hardships, all the struggles, all the frustrations, all the discomfort that we call life, let me go ahead and tell you something. It will pale in comparison and become insignificant to standing before your king. So I have to ask you again, what is your real guiding light? If you say, yes, God is my guiding light, then it's because daily you are seeking to walk where Jesus would have you walk. John chapter eight, verse 12 says this. Yeah, there we go. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in what? Darkness. But will have the light of life. Are you walking daily with the Savior who is the light of the world? That's God's guidance. Are you allowing him to guide your life? David talks about that guiding light in Psalms chapter 23, where he says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for whose name's sake? His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't care how low you might feel in this moment, you are not alone. I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, they rod and thy staff, they comfort me. David went on to say of God's word that it's a lamp into his feet and a light into his path. Church, you were never promised an easy journey, but what you were promised over and over again in God's word, again and again and again, is that he would guide you through it. That Christmas star represented God's glory, but it also represented God's guidance. Is he your guiding light? We're all following something, church. Your direction determines your destination. Your direction determines your destination, and who you are following determines that direction. Ask yourself this morning, Am I headed in the direction of what God wants or what I want? Are you allowing God to lead you? We all know from looking at the Bible that the Magi, that is the wise men, understood messianic prophecy. In other words, they understood the prophecy about the coming king. They had read the Bible and those prophecies had gone far and wide. How do we know? Because when they looked up and they saw the star and they understood what it meant and they followed it, obviously they had faith not just to be aware of it, but to step out and move because of it. They allowed God to guide them. Let God guide you. They surrendered whatever their personal plans to be a part of God's plan. Does that describe you and I this morning? They sacrificed time, energy, and personal resources, and yes, this is risky, even their reputation to make their way to worship him. Does that describe you and I? I'm convinced they did it all because of what they believed they would find, the gift. The gift. You see, the star didn't just speak of God's glory. It didn't just speak of God's guidance. It also spoke of the gift. Number three, the star speaks of God's gift. Here's some men, some wise men, the magi, who must have been of some status in the world because when they showed up, At the door of Jesus, they didn't come empty-handed. After all, they showed up with gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You know what these are? Rather elaborate gifts. These gifts certainly would have been of quality by the people of that day, and they were all worthy of a king. But yet, all of these gifts combined a thousand times over 
did not compare to the marvelous gift of beholding the star that led them to the place where they found their Savior. This morning, have you reached that place the Magi reached? Has God guided you with his light to the gift of Jesus Christ? The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, it says that the wages of sin is death. Here's what that means. Everybody in this room has sinned at some point in time, and because of that sin, we're now separated from God, and when we die, we deserve to be separated from him for all eternity and cast into hell. That scripture is depressing. But the second part is awesome. But the gift. But the gift, that is Jesus, coming to earth as a little tiny baby. He didn't have to, he wanted to. No one forced him, he offered. But the gift of God is eternal life. And because of Jesus, we don't just have to be aware of our creator. We can be in relationship with him. Now, this is not a gift with some beautiful bow. It's not a gift you find in a bag, but rather it is a gift beyond a star. A gift given in a little town called Bethlehem. A gift of a baby, Christ the Lord. Not only did he come to live on earth, but through his life, his death, and his resurrection, he's now come to live in you and me. He came as a gift to all. For all to receive him. You see, Jesus is the gift of salvation. Jesus is the gift of salvation. John chapter 3, verse 16, it says that God so loved the world. Who's the world? That's you and me. That he sent his only son. It's not like he had a dozen or more and he goes, well, you know, I don't even like that one. He sent his only son to earth and whoever believes in him would not perish. Remember the death I mentioned earlier? It's referencing that again. It's saying you don't have to face death in hell because my son has come to redeem and forgive you of your mess. That whoever believes in him would not perish but would have everlasting Now, how many of you know that is so good? Jesus could have just stopped there. He could have said, one and done, I did my job going home to heaven. But Jesus, he always shows up in a big way. He said in the Old Testament, he says, I am that I am. In other words, whatever you've got, I can meet the need. Whatever you're looking for, I can do that too. That's why Jesus is not only the gift of salvation, but scripture also tells us in Philippians that Jesus is the gift of strength. Philippians tells us, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In Acts chapter two, verse eight, we find out that Jesus is the gift of power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You're feeling weak. You feel like you can't do it. God's got you. Or what about this one? We also find out that Jesus is the gift of provision. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, this is awesome. I love the way it says it. And God blesses abundantly in all things at all times. Having all that you need, you will abound. And Isaiah goes on to tell us that Jesus is the gift of peace. Some of us are struggling in this holiday season. We're wondering how we're gonna get through it because of loss that we're facing, because of hurt that's filled our lives, because we don't know where our next paycheck or meal is gonna come from. Guess what? Our God is bigger than a circumstance and he can give us peace that passes all understanding. But it's not even just about peace. We find out in 1 Peter that Jesus is also the gift of healing, that by his stripes on the cross, and when he got whipped on that day, we are healed. 
And of course, we find out in Psalms when David tells us that Jesus is the gift of forgiveness. He said, you, Lord, are good and forgiving. And you hear all that call out to you. This Christmas season, I've got news for you. Jesus is the gift. Jesus is the gift that keeps on giving. But church, it all starts with salvation. There's no need to move on to the rest of it until we move beyond just a knowledge that he exists somewhere out there and we actually step into the relationship that he made available by coming to earth for you and I. I mentioned it earlier when I said in Romans 3, 6, 23 that we've all sinned. And because of it, we deserve to be in separation with God. That upset God so much that it says again in John three sixteen, like I said, that he sent his only son. And now 1 John 1, 9 tells us if we just confess with our mouths that he is Lord, guess what? He's able to show up in a big way. He's able to show up in a big way and forgive us of our sin and we're able to be cleansed from all of our unrighteousness. And now we can be in relationship with him, knowing like I've said over and over again, that eternity with him awaits us at the end. starts with the gift of salvation. As the band is coming up, I want to encourage everybody in this room, move beyond just a knowledge that Christianity and Christmas is somehow connected. Move beyond just an awareness of what an activity looks like and become aware of what that means in your day-to-day. -day. It means you can have a relationship with your creator. But we have to confess with our mouths that he is Lord. And we've gotta ask him to forgive us of our sins. So if you're in this place today, and maybe you've known about Jesus, but you're ready to start knowing him personally, this is your moment. Don't let it pass you by. Think about the thousands and thousands of people that noticed the same star in the sky, but they let it just be there as some anomaly. It took the Magi stepping up saying, I don't fully understand it, but I'll go. In this moment, know this, there is a star and it's calling you home. You may not know the wholeness of what it means to you, but know that Jesus is real. His love for you is real and it's time for you to come to him. So in the count of three, if you need to come home to Jesus, if you need to receive the salvation I'm talking about, I want you to raise your hand. You may say, well, people might say, who cares? Just like the Magi, forget about your reputation and understand what you're doing. If that's you on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand if you need to give your life to Jesus. One, two, three, if that's you. I see that hand, I see that hand, yes, I see that hand. Yes, I see those hands right there, yes, yes, yes. Yes, I see your hand, I see your hand. Yes, right back there, yeah. We celebrate with you, we celebrate with you. Just like the angels sing praises, know this, there are angels singing right now in celebration about the decision you're making for him. I want everybody to stand up on their feet right now and we're gonna pray this prayer of salvation. And around here at Grace, I don't want it just to be the people that raise their hand. We're all gonna pray it together because we do things family style, because we live out our faith, not as individuals, but it's a team sport. We're in it together. So we're gonna pray in agreement with these people that are making a decision for Christ today. So I want everybody to repeat this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, I'm coming home. Forgive me of my sin. I don't want that. I want you. I'm ready to follow you anywhere. Be my guiding light. I receive your gift of salvation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
man and amen. Let's give it up. Let's celebrate with these guys that are making a decision for Jesus today. For the rest of you in the room, I want you to stay right where you're at because God's not done with you yet. There's a group of people in this place and you have felt lost. You feel like you're wandering around aimlessly. He's ready to be your guiding light. Let him lead the way and stop trying to do it all on your own this Christmas season. And as you go out into that dark, dark, dark world, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine with the glory of God in your life. No one can turn off that light in your life but you. Absorb his glory and share the afterglow. Right now, we're gonna go into a song of victory right now. And as you sing it, I want you to welcome in that afterglow. I want you to acknowledge your king and let him know wherever you go, I go, God be God. And for the rest of you that maybe you're looking for a gift of strength, peace, provision, you know what you need. Receive that gift. The star, the star, the star is here to lead you home. Let's worship together. Let's worship together, church.